My name is Gal Oshry. I'm a product manager at AWS working on SageMaker. I'm here with Emily Weber, Principal ML Specialist SA at AWS, and Dan Padnos, VP of Platform at AI21 Labs. And we're excited to talk to you today about training machine learning models at scale with Amazon SageMaker. We're going to discuss the benefits and challenges of large-scale machine learning. We're going to talk about how Amazon SageMaker can help accelerate that training with a deep dive into distributed training. We'll show a case study of training and deploying a stable diffusion model, and then we'll hear from AI21 about how they're transforming the way we read and write with generative AI. So machine learning has proven itself to be useful across a wide range of applications, from recommendations to credit risk prediction, and from autonomous driving to machine translation. Recently, there's been an explosion in large-scale deep learning models for natural language processing, or NLP, and computer vision. On the right here, on the left, we see a model, a stack down model, and an image that I generated of a living room. You can see that it's not entirely coherent. It's a bit messy. GAN models, or generative adversarial networks, were really popular around 2017. And you might remember those small faces that they would generate that were kind of blurry. And even though they looked like humans, you could tell that they were not real. On the right, we have just an image that was generated by Stable Diffusion just five years later. If you have to look really closely at it to tell that it's not actually real. Generative AI is going to lead to a host of new applications from video game asset creation to, um, to copywriting and many more. So how did this happen? Well, first of all, there were notable alg algorithmic improvements, specifically the transformer architecture that was released in 2017. But alongside that, the rise of the using larger data sets, larger models, and more compute led to significant improvements in the models that are being trained. It turns out that we can continue increasing the size of the data and the model and continue getting better and better results following a power law. There's ongoing research into the exact scaling laws and how they, what are the boundaries and where does this really stop. But for now, it looks like we can continue increasing the size and the data of the model and the data to get better and better results. So that's great. Why don't we just turn up that scale dial all the way and get state-of-the-art models for every use case. But there are many challenges involved in doing this, and I'm not going to be able to cover all of them today. The first is hardware. You want to be using the latest hardware. Every few years, the latest hardware gives you around 2x to 9x better performance from various benchmarks. So if, you're, if these models are taking weeks or months to train, and you're losing out on those performance benefits, you're not going to be able to feasibly train the best model for your use case. You also want to make sure that that hardware is working well for you to minimize the disruption during the training of the model. We have to think about orchestration, spinning up the cluster, spinning it down, making sure that the network and security configurations are working well, making sure that the machine learning team is not interfering with each other when they run their various workloads. We have to think about big data sets. Storing, processing, and loading them for machine learning training is not an easy task and can require a lot of development effort to do efficiently. We have to think about scaling up the infrastructure as well as the algorithms. The models that we talk about today often don't fit on a single GPU. So you have to think about how to split that model across GPUs but continue training it efficiently. And finally, we have to think about cost. You might have seen in the research papers that these large-scale models can cost hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars to train. The other side of that is that you want to think about the machine learning team and making sure that they remain unblocked. So instead of working on infrastructure, they can focus on trying out new model ideas to make sure that your, your business kind of is driving towards the, the best results with the model. Luckily, SageMaker helps accelerate large-scale model training by helping you with all of these challenges. Now, Amazon SageMaker helps you build, train, and deploy machine learning models for any use case 
using managed infrastructure, tools, and workflows. Within Amazon SageMaker, we have SageMaker training jobs that allow you to train large-scale models, both the large models that we're focusing on today, as well as many models when you're training thousands of models a day for your various use cases. There are many benefits to using Amazon SageMaker training jobs. I'm only going to focus on a couple of them today. On the lower layer, we have infrastructure, where SageMaker gives you access to the latest hardware, including NVIDIA GPUs and AWS Trainium, as well as fast network interconnect between the instances, which is critical for distributed training. In the middle layer, we have the managed infrastructure and tooling capabilities. SageMaker takes care of large-scale cluster orchestration for you. It spins up the cluster. It spins it down at the end. It helps with all this security and network configuration so that you can keep your customer data and IP safe easily. There are also health checks at the beginning of the training job to make sure that the hardware is functioning effectively and reduce the disruption to your training jobs. The orchestration also means that you only pay for what you use. You're only paying while that cluster is up and training models for you so that you don't have to pay 24-7 for all of that expensive hardware. There are also tools for profiling, debugging, and monitoring your experiments, as well as for hyperparameter optimization with various strategies to make sure that you get the best models possible. In the top layer, we have frameworks and libraries that are optimized for AWS, such as TensorFlow, PyTorch, and Hugging Face that are really easy to use on SageMaker as well as SageMaker distributed training libraries that help you work with very large data sets or very large models. There are huge performance improvements to using these libraries, and Emily will talk about them shortly. But I want to note that you can actually bring in any library or framework that you want and use it in SageMaker, such as DeepSpeed or Megatron. You have full flexibility in how you train your models, and you can pick and choose the tools that SageMaker offers to get the best performance and to whatever works best with your workflow. So I've talked a lot about the capabilities and the benefits of Amazon SageMaker training jobs, but let's talk a bit about how it works. So to train a model, we need some compute to run our training code on some data set. The way I do this with SageMaker training is through ephemeral training clusters. When I submit a training job, SageMaker will spin up a cluster based on the cluster configuration that I choose. It will load the training code from ECR. It will load the data from S3 and begin training. Throughout training, it will output logs and metrics to CloudWatch, synchronize my model checkpoints over to S3, and at the end of the job, spin down the cluster. One benefit of this is that if the job fails for whatever reason in the middle of the night, the cluster spins down and you stop paying for the job. However, if you've written your code to be resilient and be able to resume from checkpoints, you can set the training job to automatically restart without manual intervention. Here's the core code you use to get started with training jobs, the estimator API. Here I've chosen the PyTorch estimator, and I'm giving it the entry point sifr10.py. This is very similar to the script that I would run locally on my laptop to train that model. And we call this script mode. There are many ways of using SageMaker training jobs with more flexibility. I can provide my own Docker container, or less, but easier to get started with, such as the built-in algorithms. This is script mode, where I'm just providing a script very similar to what I have on the laptop. I then define the framework in Python version that I want to use, as well as the instance type, the number of instances, and the hyperparameters for the training job. I can go and easily change these at any time now to launch other training jobs to try out different instance types and see what hardware might work best for my use case. Finally, I give the metric definitions. This tells SageMaker how to parse the logs that I output from the script so that it can send those metrics over to CloudWatch and so that I can look at them later. Finally, I call estimator.fit with, with the path to my training data. Once I've launched the training job, I can immediately see the metadata and the progress of the job in AWS console or through the APIs. I can easily clone the job even to reproduce it with the exact same settings. Now, I've seen many ML teams 
log their experiments in spreadsheets or even in docs. And that's not extremely efficient, right? There's a lot of manual work that goes into that. It makes it difficult to reproduce things you've done in the past. And it makes it difficult to collaborate with teammates if you're trying to share what you've done so they can build on, on top of it. Having this done automatically in SageMaker is a huge help. But again, you can bring in your own tools if you want that, such as TensorBoard. I also talked about loading data into SageMaker from S3. But there are actually various options that you can use depending on your use case. For S3, for example, the simplest way to, to load the data is something we call file mode, where you download the training data before the training begins. And this is great if you have relatively small data sets. But if they're pretty large, you might not want to wait for the, training, for the data sets to be completely loaded to the training cluster before training begins. So we, last year, we launched fast file mode, which lets you stream the data directly from S3 with the same interface as file mode. So without writing any additional code, you can immediately benefit from streaming the data instead of loading it right at the beginning. Apart from S3, you can also load data from EFS, which is great if that's where you're storing all of your data sets, or from FSx for Lustre, which is what we recommend for very large scale use cases to get the best throughput. We have a blog post out that explains which data source and which input mode might be best for you, depending on your use case as well as your data set characteristics. I now want to talk about two capabilities that we launched in the last few months that are really exciting. The first is heterogeneous clusters. There are certain ML use cases where you're running heavy computation on both the GPU and the CPU. For example, computer vision. You might be doing data augmentation and pre-processing on the CPUs, but doing the neural net training on the GPUs. If you're having a lot of data augmentation, you might end up bottlenecking on the CPU and the GPU will remain underutilized. Given that that's the most expensive resource, you want to avoid that. You want to really get to a high utilization on the GPUs. Now, in the past, with SageMaker training, you could only launch clusters with a single instance type, let's say 32 P4 instances. So you get a certain number of GPUs and CPUs in a fixed ratio. To avoid that bottleneck, you could you know, try to increase the number of instances in the cluster to get more CPUs, but that also increases your GPUs, so your utilization does not change. So that is why we launched heterogeneous clusters, where you can have a training job, use both P4 instances and, let's say, C5 instances. And now, what you can do is do all the data pre-processing on the CPU instances, load the data over to the P4 instances to do the neural net training. We, again, we have a blog post out for this that explains, you know, it gives code samples and explains how you can figure out whether this might be useful for your use case. And we're seeing a price performance benefit of up to 46% by switching over to this from clusters with a single instance type. The next feature I want to talk about is warm pools. So especially before you start large scale training, you might want to do a lot of experimentation or debugging to make sure the model is working correctly. So you want to start many training jobs in quick succession. However, because SageMaker launches a new cluster at the beginning of the training job, there can be a slight wait of a few minutes before this happens, before the training begins. And we've actually done a lot of work over the last year to get that time down. So it's much faster now. But our, we want to do more for our customers. So we built warm pools. You can now add a parameter when you create the training job to tell SageMaker that you want to keep the cluster alive for, let's say, 10 minutes after the training job ends. If you start another job within that 10 minutes that can reuse that cluster, SageMaker will have a much, much faster startup time, around 30 seconds or much lower. Our customers have already given us really good feedback around how this helps quick experimentation and debugging, and or even for production jobs where you have many models training sequentially. I'm now going to hand it over to Emily to talk about distributed training with Amazon SageMaker. Great. 
Uh, so today, uh, we're going to talk about distributed training now that you've learned about why large models are interesting, uh, why they're valuable, why they're a project you should think about um, back at work. And we've learned about some of the challenges and some of the ways that Amazon SageMaker is helping ease those challenges. Uh, we've looked about training overall. Now let's unpack distributed training in particular. Uh, so why do we need distributed training? Why can't we just use single GPUs? As it turns out, and as you've been following over the last five years, the size of models is exploding. As the scaling laws are showing us, uh, we can potentially uh, triple accuracy on our models simply by 10xing the size of those models. To 10x a model, you need also a 10x increase in the data set size, in the compute costs, and the compute sizes. Uh, and in particular, the increase in model sizes is faster than the increase in GPU size. So hardware has been increasing uh, throughout that time, but it's been increasing at a slower pace. And so as you can imagine, this leads to a bottleneck where models are simply too large to fit onto single GPUs. And so what we're seeing customers uh, implement today and helping customers implement is distributed training that runs on multiple GPUs at from very small scales to just maybe a handful of nodes all the way up to uh, more than 100 nodes and hundreds and thousands of GPUs in a single SageMaker job. So before we unpack the large scale training in a single job, uh, I'd like to share with you many different kinds of distributed training. And hopefully you can see yourself in this journey. I would say most customers actually progress along these three different types. Now the first type of distributed training, we're gonna unpack this afternoon, is what I like to call job parallelism. And job parallelism is very easy to achieve on SageMaker because of our training job uh, API. And so you can easily call the training API to launch a single job and then immediately call that same API to launch another job and then another, and another. So you can easily run uh, tens to hundreds of jobs concurrently. Now each job can be processing different data sets, can be using different packages, using different scripts, but they're all running within the same control plane. So I have customers who train thousands of models on SageMaker, and usually there's some middle ground where each job will be running a subset of the data and a subset of the models. So we're gonna unpack that I actually use job parallelism in the case study uh, we'll look at this afternoon in terms of training uh, stable diffusion on SageMaker and downloading and processing all of the data using job parallelism. So once we've parallelized our jobs, uh, we need to implement data parallelism. And so data parallelism is a method to take your model and actually copy your model across all available GPUs in your training cluster. So we'll shard the data out to those GPUs, but copy the model in order to increase the throughput on your training time. And so data parallelism is an excellent next step in your distributed training journey that is an efficient way to increase the runtime of your models. And then once you've implemented job parallelism and implemented data parallelism, a good next step is model parallelism. So model parallelism is a way to train a large model that can't fit on a single GPU. So if you're looking at models that range anywhere from, say, 7 billion parameters to 11, to 13, to 20, 60, 100, 175, multiple trillions of parameters, uh, model parallelism is the way to do this because those models are physically too large uh, to rest on a single GPU, so we need a parallelism strategy uh, to leverage those. So let's dive in. So again, job parallelism, you can train models, again, on SageMaker at a very high frequency. Uh, the process for this is straightforward. Uh, we're gonna start with a data input, be that S3, FSx for Lustre, or EFS, and then uh, my favorite way of doing this is, is simply a for loop where you're gonna loop through all of the models that you want to train, all of the tasks that you need to implement, and then for each of those, uh, simply point to the relevant data in S3, uh, point to the relevant output file, also in S3, uh, define the job parameters 
again, for each of those individual jobs, and then call model.fit or estimator.fit. And as Gauss told us earlier, uh, when we call estimator.fit, again, that's launching uh, instances on the remote SageMaker training backend, which you can then view and monitor and control and govern. Uh, the one parameter here to, to note is, is that um, uh, complex weight equals false. I'm, I'm kidding you there. It's a very easy parameter. Uh, so set weight equal to false, uh, and then your Jupyter notebook, if that's where you're running it, uh, will be released. Like the, the kernel will be available. If you set weight equal to true, that'll just hold your kernel. Uh, and so you can also use the new warm pool features uh, to enable retraining very, very quickly. Uh, so if in a, in a single, uh, say, five, 10 minute period, you wanted to train a few hundred XGBoost models, and say each of these XGBoost models had maybe a few megabytes, maybe a few GBs of parameters or, or uh, model sizes, data sizes, uh, you could enable that warm pool feature to just iterate through that so much faster, uh, and then you don't have to wait for that job spin up time between each resource. But again, all of this content uh, is easily uh, reproduced and visible in the SageMaker control plane. Uh, so you can view content that you ran six months ago, 12 months ago, multiple years ago, uh, and it's still available. So now that we understand job parallelism a little bit more, let's see if we can unpack data parallelism. And if you're new to distributed training, as I was two years ago, uh, if you're new to distributed training, when you hear data parallel, I want you to think massive data. Uh, data parallel unlocks scenarios where your data set is just extremely large, uh, so massive data. So there are, have been some historical approaches uh, to data parallelism, as you can imagine, in, in machine learning and deep learning. Uh, one of the first approaches for this was called the parameter server, uh, where your parameter server is, is literally one uh, primary uh, leader node, and this leader node is communicating with all of these worker nodes. Uh, it's looking at the gradient updating on each of these nodes, communicating with them, ensuring that the GPUs are healthy, uh, that that instance is, is live, and that the gradients are being updated. Parameter servers are reliable. Um, and they're a little bit slow, but they're actually somewhat efficient in terms of the bandwidth that they're using. However, the slowness uh, led to the ring-based topology that you see on the right-hand side, uh, which is this MPI all reduce. Uh, this is the same algorithm you've seen in Horvod uh, and in PyTorch distributed data parallel. At AWS, uh, we have a custom communications uh, protocol that enables optimized uh, inter-GPU communication between nodes on AWS. This is how you achieve state-of-the-art performance for large-scale distributed training on the cloud, full stop. Uh, and so this gives you a 20 to 40% boost uh, over native frameworks. So if we're using uh, PyTorch distributed data parallel or Horvod, pointing to uh, the SageMaker distributed training backend that you see here will actually increase uh, the speed of your job. How do we do that? Through optimized primitives. Uh, and so essentially, again, the, um, so the CPUs are actually operating as parameter servers, and then the GPUs are executing as the, the workers. Um, the, the paper for SMDDP is available online if you'd like to see it, and it's available in the uh, SageMaker training portfolio. Uh, we're excited to have Amazon as a customer. Uh, so we've worked with Amazon Search uh, to enable large-scale training on Amazon Search. Uh, so when you're looking for new products on Amazon.com, uh, we're actually training a model uh, in the back end to provide better recommendations for the products that you leverage. Uh, and the scientists at Amazon Search uh, like using PyTorch Lightning. And in particular, they like every scientist. They like running large-scale jobs. Uh, and they like getting results quickly and efficiently. Uh, and so we worked with their uh, delivery teams to enable distributed training. And as you can see, as we increase uh, the number of nodes in the overall job, uh, this increases the speed and then reduces the overall runtime. And so by moving from one to eight instances, uh, we we're able to increase the speed of this by 7.3 times. Uh, and so we're, we're excited to, to work with Amazon. Now let's take a look at model parallelism. And so model parallelism on SageMaker, uh, again, is a way to enable large-scale model training uh, where you're able to bring a custom neural network that has you know, 10, 15, or, or again, hundreds of billions of parameters, and then easily shard these on multiple GPUs. 
And we also uh, developed a really interesting way of enabling hierarchical GPU communication. Uh, so specifically, sharded data parallelism is 40% faster than deep speed uh, on AWS and on SageMaker, and it leverages a hierarchical GPU communication that looks first within data parallel groups and then second across data parallel groups. Uh, one of our customers of SageMaker distributed training is LGAI. Uh, so LGAI implemented a really fascinating tilde model that actually generates new fashion. It generates new clothing designs, uh, and they use this to design a new line of clothing, which we then, they then took to New York Fashion Week and won an award. <laughs> so uh, they did this nine times faster using this machine learning model, and they were able to train the model 60% faster uh, using StageMaker distributed training. So we're thrilled to, to work with LGAI on this fascinating generative AI use case. And now uh, let's take a look at a case study of training stable diffusion on SageMaker. And so there were six primary steps uh, that I implemented in this case study. Uh, so first, I downloaded 10 terabytes of images. Uh, and I ran this on 19 parallel CPU-based jobs. I'd strongly recommend using CPUs as much as you can. They're very cheap, <laughs> they're very effective, uh, and very available. So uh, certainly, I leveraged uh, 18 large CPU-based jobs to download and then process uh, image text pairs, which is the base uh, for stable diffusion. After that, I leveraged SageMaker Studio. I love developing on Studio because you can easily switch from tiny to large instances in just a few minutes. Uh, so I started with two CPUs on SageMaker Studio, and then in two minutes, moved up to 96 CPUs in my same notebook without leaving my notebook uh, in order to analyze and process my large data set. So after that, I did one quick lightweight job test uh, on the SageMaker training API. I set up FSX for Lustre, uh, pointing to my relevant VPC credentials, enabled a data repository, so it pointed to S3. Uh, I built a data index, actually using a large JSON lines uh, with 50 million image text pairs, and then ultimately ran my final job. I ran my job using 200 GPUs on SageMaker training, so that's 24 uh, P4 instances on SageMaker training. Uh, in terms of iterations per second, this is actually 10 times faster than my single node baseline. So I was amazed uh, to see that just sheer throughput speed up. Uh, my training loop alone completed in 15 minutes. Now the overall job still took, took an hour, don't get me wrong. That hour included the GPUs initializing, uh, nickel running health checks, um, and then the actual upload uh, of the Model 2 S3, but the training loop itself uh, was a whopping 15 minutes. So I was, I was thrilled uh, to see that, that throughput. And so now I'm gonna show you some of the visuals from that uh, so we can walk through it together. And so first, uh, again, I enabled job parallelism. So I ran 18 concurrent CPU-based jobs on SageMaker training. I had a list of Parquet files, uh, which is the core of the Lion 5B data set. It's, it's composed of Parquet files. So I walked through 18 of those Parquet files, and then for each file, I ran a job. That job used the same base libraries, it used the same input and output paths effectively, uh, and then again downloaded this file running on 18 SageMaker jobs at the same time. After downloading the jobs, uh, I enabled FSX for Luster. I was shocked by how quickly I could enable Luster. Uh, I would say this took me about 20 minutes of my own time uh, and quite a few, and very, very quickly the, the volume initialized in the back end. Um, essentially, creating Luster is very simple. Uh, you point to an S3 data path, uh, and then with maybe five clicks uh, in the AWS console, you can create a Luster volume and then point to that from your SageMaker resource. Uh, the real reason, um, a, a big reason we use Luster and SageMaker training is to eliminate the data download time. Uh, so it takes time to download your data from S3 to the training resource. You can bypass that using FSX for Luster. I estimate that it saved me at least 90 minutes uh, in training time, which is actually longer than my full job. So strongly recommend Luster. Once I enabled Luster, 
Uh, again, I used SageMaker Studio uh, to do local development and test. Here's a view where I was running uh, on my 96 CPUs. Uh, this was a C5.24XL machine that I was running on my Studio Notebook. Uh, I built this custom data loader uh, in Studio and then uh, built that Hugging Face Data Sedict object, uh, which I then passed into the training file. After this, after this, I scaled up to 200 GPUs with SageMaker training. Uh, so I pointed to, again, my, my fine-tuning data sets, uh, pointed to everything that was available on FSX for Lester, passed my SageMaker distributed training hyperparameters. Um, I did enable, actually, the warm pooling when I was running at uh, smaller scales, and then ran my job. And so, again, the job took about 40 minutes to complete. Uh, after my job was complete, I hosted actually the, the pre-trained model on a SageMaker real-time endpoint and then generated a visual for you all. So the visual was a Christmas tree in Las Vegas. Uh, I hope you enjoy the result of this model that's stable diffusion on SageMaker. And so with that, uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Gal. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to uh, share this session with Gal and Emily. Uh, my name is Dan. Um, I work at AI21 Labs, and I'm here to share our story uh, on how we develop and share our large language models with developers. Uh, so I'll start with a quick overview of AI21 Labs, who we are and what we do. Uh, we're based in Tel Aviv at the end of a 20-hour flight. So if I faint, that's just jet lag. Don't worry. Um, and we're on a mission to um, transform the way people read and write. We feel that these experiences have not really changed in a very long time. So we still type in our documents, our emails, our whatnot, one letter at a time, one character at a time. And when we receive those documents or emails, we read them one word at a time. Um, and often these are painful, slow, tedious experiences. Uh, we think that generative AI, and in particular injecting large language models as thought partners into the reading and writing processes, uh, can really transform the way people uh, interact with reading and writing and result in huge productivity gains for everybody. Um, so the way we approach this vision is uh, in two ways. First, we have our applications um, that target uh, the consumer. Um, so if you haven't tried WordTune and WordTune Read, I really encourage you to give them a shot. They will improve your life uh, for the better and help you uh, read faster and better and write faster and better. And if you don't believe me, you can ask one of our 5 million uh, users. I can tell you that an uh, overwhelming majority of them are very happy. Um, and the other way we approach this vision is with our developer platform called AA21 Studio, where we provide API access to uh, the same large language models that uh, power the technology throughout uh, our products. Um, so I'll be talking about AA21 Studio mainly today and about the large language models that are available on Studio. Um, maybe a good way to start would be to uh, remind everybody why large language models are such a, a cool piece of technology and a very useful piece of technology. Uh, so large is a very unscientific word, right? What's, what's a large language model? Um, is it a 100 million uh, parameter model? Well, five years ago, that would have totally counted as a very large language model. Um, but since then, we, the research community and practitioners in industry, have scaled up language models by many orders of magnitude. Uh, and the surprising observation has been that with every increase in size, uh, we've unlocked uh, new and unexpected capabilities. Uh, so back in 2017, we were justifiably impressed with models like BERT uh, that really uh, move the needle on uh, accuracy and robustness of natural language understanding tasks like uh, uh, classifying topics or uh, figuring out uh, sentiment analysis. 
And then just a couple of years later, with models in the few billion parameter range, uh, uh, we saw that for the first time, language models and machines can generate uh, coherent, fluent text um, of, of, of around a paragraph, let's say a tweet or more. Uh, and fast forward two years later, uh, it, with models at the 100 billion parameter range, uh, all of a sudden we have this sci-fi technology that can generate an article and it will be self-consistent and coherent and readable. Um, so that unlocks um, uh, many new use cases. Uh, and in fact, in this you know, sample of, of uh, some of our customers, uh, you see uh, a whole range of industries and types of organizations that leverage these models uh, for new things uh, every day. So you will see research organizations, you will see gaming, you will see financial institutions, um, large online platforms, everything. Uh, advertising, obviously, a big, uh, a big use case. Um, and what I want to really emphasize about large language models is that, first, they enable these sci-fi new uh, generative AI use cases. But also, in general, anything you want to do with text, any sort of NLP task, um, more resembling the traditional NLP stuff or more futuristic, like uh, the generative stuff, um, is way easier with large language models. Uh, they allow you to take very significant shortcuts and really speed up the development process, uh, thanks primarily to the fact that large language models can generalize really well from um, very small samples of data. So you can use the power of natural language to guide the models to perform the task that you want. Um, and this has become commonly referred to as prompt engineering and usually takes the shape of either a few shot prompt where you collect just a few examples, let's say five or 10, um, that demonstrate uh, what the task that you want to perform actually is, or even in the extreme case, in uh, zero shot prompts where uh, you're just telling the model, instructing it in natural language, uh, what you want to do. So we'll take a look at what that means in a second. Um, and maybe let's start with uh, a generative use case, more in the sci-fi side of things. Um, so um, this is uh, an example of uh, a prompt and a completion that we got from uh, uh, our language model. Uh, so with zero shot, all we have here is a natural language instruction that appears in bold text. Um, and then the text right below it is what the model generated. So uh, here the, uh, uh, what we're requesting the model is to compose a, a press release uh, from the Humboldt University Department of Metaphysics announcing a dramatic increase in the number of ghost sightings this year. Now, to the best of my knowledge, neither the Department of Metaphysics nor ghosts really exist, so obviously, we're trying to do something humorous here. Um, um, and the amazing thing, I think, is that uh, this is a pre-trained model that wasn't trained to perform this task. And it picks up on a number of very important things in this natural language instruction. First, take a look at the output. It looks like a press release. It reads like a press release. Second, it also picks up on the um, humorous nuance here, right? Uh, which is pretty mind-blowing. So, uh, we have a press release, it starts off kind of serious, and then you get to the funny part, right, where there's a quote from the professor saying that uh, they're not sure um, why we're seeing so many ghosts, but it has to do something with, uh, with uh, probably the upcoming Halloween, and that makes sense because the press release is dated October 31st. Um, so really things that were uh, completely unbelievable just a few years ago this is the pace that this field is progressing in. Um, now let's do something that at first glance feels um, a little more traditional, but I would argue it's also completely transformed when you apply language models to this problem. So extracting insights from text has been, you know, a very common use case for uh, NLP in general. Um, let's take an example here of extracting insights from hotel reviews. So let's say we um, have uh, a bunch of hotel reviews. Maybe we run some sort of marketplace or booking website. Um, and we want to uh, be able to provide feedback to the hotel owners uh, about how their hotel is doing, right? Um, so let's not do boring, plain old uh, sentiment analysis, where you just 
uh, say the re review is positive, the review is negative, or the review is neutral, and then you don't know what to do with a review that's partly that and partly that, and also the information is very coarse grain. Um, let's do something better. Let's um, build this output, which is flexible, and it's a mapping from uh, topics mentioned in the review to um, sentiment. So, for example, we could have a review that says uh, cleaning wasn't great, the air conditioning also not great, but the service was fantastic, and the hotel facility is also good. Um, so this is arguably a very useful uh, uh, tool to have. Uh, and the beautiful thing is that with large language models, you can set it up in under 15 minutes, whereas with sort of classical methods, even ones that leverage uh, deep learning models, you would have to scratch your head a little bit, uh, because this does not fit a standard template of any of the classical tasks as they are you know, defined in a textbook. And the flexibility of large language models really shows here. Um, so what we have on the left is just a screenshot from uh, the AI21 Studio uh, uh, no-code playground uh, that lets you uh, experiment with prompts. And we've set up a few shot prompt there that as input has reviews and as output has this mapping of topics and sentiment. Um, and um, what you see is also that we've insisted on uh, having the output as this sort of JSON uh, string that you can immediately parse and, and use in a downstream uh, 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 process, uh, which is nice, right? Because then we don't have to worry about parsing the output. It's just immediately machine readable. Um, so with very quick experimentation, you can set up a prompt like this, uh, run a bunch of reviews for a given hotel through it, um, and you will be able to get something like the dashboard you see on the right uh, that tells you uh, the different topics and counts the number of positive and negative uh, reviews. Um, this would have been a pretty uh, complicated project, I think, just a few years ago. And this is something that one data scientist can do in an afternoon, start to finish, uh, with large language models. Uh, if you want to learn more, check out the QR code. We have a whole blog post explaining how to set something like this up. Um, so yeah, just to recap large language models, um, they're definitely going to disrupt the way we read and write across industries, across use cases, uh, that's for sure. Other than that, they're going to make life way easier for anyone doing anything related to NLP. Uh, so all of the tasks and the use cases that you see here will become um, uh, much more widespread and accessible. Um, and AI21 Studio and our Jurassic One language models are really a part of that uh, revolution. So we launched AI21 Studio um, last August, so uh, a year and a half ago. We launched with two models. Um, we call them Jurassic One Large and Jurassic One Jumbo. Large has seven and a half billion parameters. Jumbo has 178 billion parameters. And we're proud to be uh, the first who have given uh, completely open access to uh, a model of this size. Um, you know, no wait list, no, nothing like that. Um, the uh, features that we had on the platform are really all around making um, the usability and the ease of use uh, um, a, a core part of, of the experience of interacting with these models. Uh, so the API is really simple, really easy to use. Um, we have a no-code environment so that you can start experimenting uh, just in your browser and start setting things up. Um, Fine-tuning, you betcha. Uh, just bring over your data, and in three clicks, you're there. Um, uh, yeah, and everything is, of course, priced on a usage-based uh, uh, model. Uh, you pay for what you consume, and uh, you can check it out. There's a free trial. Uh, you can get started immediately. Um, so why did we launch with two models? I said we have large at the 7.5 billion parameter size and jumbo at the 178 billion parameter size. The reason is that we recognize there's a size quality trade-off in these large language models. So this sketch sort of demonstrates that. On the vertical axis, we have uh, output quality, roughly speaking. So any metric of uh, accuracy or of the quality of the generated text, 
Um, higher is better on the, on the vertical axis. On the horizontal axis, we have the things that are related to uh, inference time and inference costs. So as we go right, lower cost, uh, better latency, so faster response times, and of course, easier scaling for massive scale applications. So on this plot, Jumbo would of course be on the top left with really good output quality uh, and some challenges on the cost and latency side. And large would be really great in terms of inference cost and latency, but uh, the quality wouldn't be as good as Jumbo. Um, now, of course, which one you pick depends on uh, your use case. So if you want to prioritize um, output quality for use cases like long form generation, if you're generating articles or if you're powering a chatbot that needs to be really compelling, uh, you would probably go for Jumbo. Um, whereas if your priority is massive scale deployment, uh, like some massive scale applications, you probably worry about uh, unit economics. So you would go for large. Uh, now the way I've set this up, uh, of course, begs the question, can we have the best of both? Um, can we have something in the top right corner where the output quality is great, uh, but we also enjoy the benefits of low latency and low cost? Um, and this was the goal of the project I'll be talking about next. So we hypothesized that a mid-size model, somewhere in between large and jumbo, uh, would achieve, in fact, the performance uh, that uh, 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 jumbo has, but at a price point much closer to large. Uh, so if we actually deliver on that promise, this would make this model um, uh, the most cost-effective option on the market and a very compelling option. Um, so we did some evaluation and planning, and we decided on a 17 billion parameter uh, architecture that took into account training times, training costs, of course, the inference time and the cost, and the expected uh, quality. Uh, when we set out to, the, uh, to do this project, we had a number of constraints. Uh, we wanted to do it quickly in under 20 days. Uh, we wanted to do it at a reasonable price. Training these models is expensive, but it can be more expensive, and it can be more and more expensive. Um, we prefer the former. Uh, so uh, a third consideration was that we wanted to keep most of our uh, existing tech stack as it is and not have to write a whole lot of new code just to uh, work with a compute provider. Uh, so SageMaker really uh, was a great fit for these constraints. Um, we heard about uh, how SageMaker uh, supports distributed training, uh, and we really enjoyed those features in this project. So everything to do with orchestration, uh, uh, even supposedly trivial things like logging get complicated when you're talking about distributed jobs. Um, and then, of course, uh, it's not always smooth sailing. These are very complicated system nodes do fail from time to time. So things like health checks and stopping and being able to resume runs when one of the nodes fails uh, were a crucial consideration here. Um, we trained Grande on uh, 32 P4D nodes, each with uh, eight A100 GPUs. So it was uh, a large scale project. Um, and uh, for this complicated large scale project, it was also valuable to have billing um, measured by, by the second. Um, and of course, like I mentioned, we wanted to keep our own tech stack and not have to change a whole bunch of things. And the ability to uh, bring our own container was really uh, crucial to making that possible. So have we achieved our goals? The answer is yes. Um, Jurassic One Grande is uh, the latest addition to the Jurassic One family. Um, uh, it's a 17 billion parameter model. It's uh, three times uh, cheaper in inference than uh, Jumbo, uh, while preserving most of the quality advantage that Jumbo has over large, as you can see in the plot on the right, which is just a short summary of uh, a, a more comprehensive benchmark that we did, including uh, multiple choice question answering tasks. Um, and of course, also, since it's a smaller model, uh, it's faster to run, which means that latency is lower. So uh, if you're using that for any sort of uh, uh, user-facing application, you will be able to enjoy uh, much lower response times. Um, uh, so you don't have to take my word for it. Again, you can take the word of our customers. 
Uh, so adoption has been really great for, uh, for Grande. Uh, we launched it just over uh, six months ago, uh, and it now accounts for about two-thirds of the AI21 Studio traffic. Um, and I think what's even uh, more convincing is that many clients uh, switched over completely to, to Grande, so either from large, uh, because they saw that they could get uh, better results without paying uh, um, a huge price in, in costs and in latency, or from Jumbo because they wanted to improve uh, unit economics without compromising uh, the quality. Um, and for this particular uh, client that we're uh, um, mentioning here, uh, who run a massive scale application for millions of users, uh, they were able to switch over to Grande, uh, reduce inference costs by a factor of four, reduce latency by the same factor, um, while improving user satisfaction um, and also growing their overall traffic. Uh, so uh, wins from all sides here. Um, the big news from yesterday, in case you missed it, is that uh, Jurassic One is now available on SageMaker with uh, um, the SageMaker uh, foundation model uh, jumpstart. Uh, so you can... Um, get started really easily uh, with uh, Jumpstart through the console. We'll have a demo in a second. Uh, and I think the big news here and the big advantage is that the whole data lifecycle uh, stays within your organization's SageMaker environment, right? So uh, instead of using uh, a model that's hosted elsewhere, you can use uh, an inference endpoint that keeps all of the data uh, securely in your hands. Uh, which is obviously a big consideration for, for many organizations. So let's take a look at, at, uh, at uh, a quick demo. So this is what it looks like when you, whoops, let's go back. Let's try this again. Is it running? Nope. Fingers crossed. Yes, okay, great. So um, this is what it looks like when you're uh, browsing uh, the marketplace and, and picking the model. You can launch uh, a quick interactive environment to experiment and, and uh, check out the results. In this example, uh, we're doing a zero-shot uh, summarization task with restaurant reviews this time, uh, all reviews themed today. Um, so you can quickly experiment and get a sense for the uh, quality of the uh, model. Uh, and if you uh, click on the link to the notebook there, it'll take you to a, a repo with uh, full instructions on how to get started. You can clone the repository uh, to your uh, SageMaker environment. Uh, and once you do that, uh, it will take you through and guide you through the process of setting up an inference endpoint um, and actually using the model. We'll see that in a second. So this is over uh, um, uh, on SageMaker with the uh, uh, notebook running. Uh, so you start by uh, spinning up an endpoint, uh, and then it takes you through the steps of, of actually uh, constructing a few shot uh, prompt and uh, uh, trying it out. Uh, so here we're doing something else. We're doing, uh, uh, we're generating CV profiles, so like an intro paragraph for your CV from a role and a set of skills. Um, there's a few examples. The input every time is a role and a set of skills, and the output is a paragraph that gives a CV intro. Um, and here we're sort of uh, constructing that prompt from just a few examples. Uh, uh, that will then feed into the uh, uh, model. We'll run completion with uh, our Python uh, SDK that goes to the uh, SageMaker endpoint as a backend. Uh, and you will get completions. So in this case, we have a uh, 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 CV profile for a sales role with uh, specified uh, uh, skills. Uh, and as you can see, you can get uh, really good quality generations from very few examples. Um, so next time you need to write uh, an intro paragraph or a bio, we've got you covered. All right. So. Uh, here are some resources to uh, get you started. And with that, I think I'm going to hand it over back to Emily. Thank you.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Stan. That's, that's such an exciting journey. So we've, we've seen the whole scope. Uh, we, we started this afternoon talking about how large models were interesting, uh, were, were maybe this, this cutting edge trend that was emerging. Uh, we looked at some vision examples. We learned about large scale training on SageMaker. Uh, and then uh, Dan walked us through a wonderful example of using large models in AI21. Uh, I know I am going to um, open up my own studio notebook this afternoon and uh, check out foundation models, and especially the AI21 foundation models. If you're looking for more resources on getting started with SageMaker, uh, feel free to take a look at our example repository. We have hundreds of example notebooks. Uh, we have excellent documentation. Uh, our distributed training documentation in particular is quite good. Uh, it has introductory concepts, advanced concepts. It explains our, our content quite well. Um, ML blogs, obviously we have hundreds of blogs uh, across a variety of use cases. Uh, and I am in fact writing a book on this topic actually. So if you'd like to learn more about pre-training your own large vision and language models, and especially with distributed training on SageMaker. Uh, it's actually available on Amazon already, the, the pre-sale. It's, it's coming out in uh, April of next year. And so with that, um, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed our session. It's been a pleasure uh, sharing these insights with you. To my co-speakers, thank you. And uh, have a great reInvent.